Hi everyone, my name's Sam Illingworth. I'm a senior lecturer in science communication at uh, the University of Western Australia. And I'm here today to moderate this science exchange series. Um, this is a online webinar where basically we try to introduce the wider public to the amazing research and researchers at the University of Western Australia to try and break down the barriers between science and society and demonstrate some of the great impact and the, um, the dialogue that's going on there as well. So I'm just going to introduce our speaker. Dr. Jeff Hansen is a senior lecturer in the School of Earth Sciences at UWA. Jeff completed his PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz in 2011 and joined UWA in 2013, following a postdoctoral appointment at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. His research expertise is in nearshore oceanography, sediment transport, and more recently, marine renewables and remote sensing. And today, Jeff is going to talk to us about where did the beach go? Please, Jeff. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Sam. Um, and the sort of the catchy title is Where Did the Beach Go? But uh, really, a pro probably a more appropriate title is an overview of coastal processes in Southwest Western Australia. Um, so thanks a lot for uh, joining today and uh, hopefully um, you get some good information out of this. So I just want to start off by highlighting that beaches are really one of the most dynamic landforms in the world. They're essentially always changing. And this is a sort of an extreme example from a colleague at UNSW. Um, but if you go down to the beach every day um, to walk your dog or whatever, you'll notice that the beach is almost always different. Um, and that's really what makes trying to understand coastal processes and coastal management quite difficult. Um, and this slide from colleagues at the US Geological Survey, I think really provides a good overview of the challenges that people that are in charge of uh, managing the coast, um, really what they face. So basically, um, the coastline changes over scales of, from seconds to centuries and from sort of individual sand grain size to um, hundreds or, or thousands of kilometers. But if you're a uh, coastal manager, you're probably most interested in the areas, the scales in that sort of red maroon box. So from say an individual beach a few hundred meters up to maybe uh, an area of coast a couple hundred Ks. Uh, and you're probably not interested in things happening on scales less than a single storm um, or uh, you know, more than a few decades. But the difficulty is that basically the changes that occur in that red box really reflect the integration of the movement of individual sand grains, right? Because if you, you, you go to the beach and the only way that the beach changes is based on the individual movements of, of sand grains. And so that's a very important scale, but it's very difficult to, and you can't, impossible basically to really to think on that scale. So um, just to point out really that managing the coast is very difficult because of this vast um, range of time and space scales. If you go down to the beach, I think um, the best way to think about what the beach looks like is it really it reflects um, a number of things that are acting to make the beach look that way. And I'll sort of go through those really in no um, particular order, but um, sand supply and size of the sand. So beaches need a consistent and sort of reliable source of sand. Um, and the size of that sand really determines how the beach looks. So, uh, sort of all else being equal, for larger sand grains are going to make the beach uh, sort of steeper, whereas uh, smaller sand grains are going to make the sand flatter. Uh, what's the average energy input? Are you on a coast that experiences large waves and has big tides, or on a site that uh, has little to no wave energy and small tides? Um, and similar to the sand size, basically, on average, wave sites that have larger waves and bigger tides are going to um, have flatter beaches. So what's the sea level? Uh, sea level is very important in determining what, at the very minimum, where the shoreline is, but um, you know, what's the present sea level and also what the past sea level has been. Um, and that ranges over um, you know, recent and more historic times. What's the underlying geology is very important. Um, so in Perth, we tend to have a lot of what are called perch beaches, where uh, there's sort of a thin veneer of sand, so about a meter of sand sitting on top of rock. Uh, and that's sort of what you saw on the title slide. 
or you go to some places and there's sand that would go down tens of meters. So what the underlying geology is really important because the beach essentially has to have a place um, to be. What are the previous conditions? What was there a storm yesterday or was there a cyclone uh, a few years ago? And those previous conditions impact what the, look, the beach likely looks like right now, as well as the pre present conditions. So how big are the waves at this moment? Is it high tide, is it low tide? So if you can kind of incorporate all of those, then you can get a reasonably good understanding of uh, what the beach is doing. And I'll go through a few of those in more detail that really reflect my uh, area of research expertise. But another and really important point that I like to make in presentations like this is that what you see when you go to the beach is just actually a small fraction of what we call the beach profile. So the beach profile sort of what incorporates the area from say behind the dunes out to what we call the wave base which is the water depth at which the waves are able to actively um, move sand around and in perth or around the coast of wa that goes out to say about 20 meters or so um, and so when you go to the beach you're really only looking at um, just that part that's um, above the water line which is quite a small part of this overall beach profile but what the beach looks like and where the shoreline is really reflects the movement of sand over that entire beach profile, which in many cases is going to extend for more than a kilometer. So you can't just consider what's happening above the water, because often um, the processes below the water are just as, if not more. So I'll, now I'm going to really kind of get into it and go through the drivers of, uh, of beach changes. And I'm sort of focused on Perth, but really most of the, what I'm going to talk about is relevant to much of the Southwest WA coast and a lot of other locations globally. Um, so the main drivers of beach changes in Perth are really the variations of, of wave height and the direction at which they come from. So that's on the sort of seasonal to storm scales and changes in the sea level and that's um, over hours um, to years. So we're looking at this contemporary time scale. So in Perth and well in Southwest WA more generally, we sort of have three dominant sources of uh, waves. Uh, and the biggest and most consistent is the Southern Ocean. So this is an image I took from uh, a forecast output yesterday. Uh, and you see four sort of red blobs to the south of Australia, and that's four separate storms marching across the Southern Ocean from left to right. And each one of those storms is sending out large waves indicated by the areas in red uh, up into the Indian Ocean and those waves are impacting the coast of WA and then also extending all the way up into the Indian Ocean. Because there's no land in the Southern Ocean uh, until you get to Antarctica, it's actually really the most active area of wave generation in the world. And the Southwest of WA is actually the, one of the most exposed areas to waves of anywhere in the world as well because of that. So the second source of waves that we have um, is from actually local winds. So uh, the storms that are in the Southern Ocean are generating waves in the Southern Ocean and those waves are emanating away from the storms and then impacting the coast. But if we have quite strong winds at our coast, we're able to generate winds actually at the coast. And this is output of the wind uh, that I took yesterday during that sort of storm that we had. Um, so on the front side, so just as the storm is first arriving on the coast of WA, we tend to have quite strong northwest winds. And those winds from the northwest make waves coming from the northwest, uh, and those are really important and um, probably the most damaging to our coast. And finally, um, in the summer, if you go down to the beach almost any afternoon, you'll notice that there tends to be quite a strong sea breeze, and that's almost always from the south-southwest. And those winds, just like the northwest winds, make waves that approach the coast from the south-southwest. Uh, and those, those waves tend to not be very big, but they are very, because of their consistent, are very important in redistributing the sand um, across the beach. And if you sort of integrate this all together, what you see basically is that we have a very cyclic nature of the wave height um, in this part of the world. So, this is just a time series from the Cape Naturalist Wave Boy over the last uh, eight years or so, showing basically that on average we have the largest waves in the wintertime uh, and much smaller waves in the summertime. And then also notice that 
you know, during some years, for example, 2013, the waves tend to be much bigger than they are in other years, say, uh, 2015. And so because these wave conditions are constantly changing, we see corresponding continual changes in our beach. And this is just an animation I made for um, Trig Point uh, over the last few years. And you can see basically the width of the beach is changing dramatically. And that's associated with the sand being taken from the beach by the waves. And that sand moves offshore. And by doing that, the waves break further offshore. And that's a means by which the beach sort of um, protects itself from those large waves. So the sand is being exchanged from the part of the beach above the water um, to the part um, below the water, and then moving back and forth. And that's a result of the uh, constantly changing uh, wave and water level conditions. So um, jumping into the, um, uh, the water levels shortly, but first it's important to point out because of our regional um, geology here, that the coastline of Perth particularly is actually pretty protected from those really large Southern Ocean Southwest swells um, that occur in the winter. And that's because uh, as you can see in this, this image here that we have um, a sort of a chain of islands going from Point Perrin um, up in Shoals up to Rottnest Island. And if the waves are coming from the Southwest, they have to cross over all of those sherry shallow areas go around the islands. And as a result, by the time that they get to the coast, they're a fair bit smaller and smaller. So we're reasonably well protected from those big, consistent southwest swells, but uh, not so much from those northwest winds because they're able to sort of shoot through from the north of the um, rot nests and come uh, along the coast. And this is a picture from that storm we had on the 25th of May that I'll talk about a little bit more from uh, City Beach. So water levels, are probably as important, or in some cases, maybe more important um, locally in determining where our, how our beaches respond. And so in Perth, we have quite uh, a unique sort of sea level climate, if you will. So we have our tides, which are about a half meter, and that's every 12 to 24 hours, but there are actually tidal va variations that are up to as large as 18.6 years. Uh, we get a lot of storm surge, um, and that can be on the order of say half a meter as well associated with the storms. And we had a bit of that yesterday, which I'll show. We have seasonal water level changes and that is around the order of 20 to 25 centimeters. And those are mainly due to variations in the strength of the Lewin current, which is the warm water current that comes along the coast of WA. And we also have interannual changes in sea level um, mostly due to El Nino, La Nina events, and those um, affect sea level by about 10 centimeters. And so if we lived in a place that had a tide range of say three to five meters or something, we wouldn't necessarily notice all of these other things, but because the tide range is only 50 centimeters, all of these other processes, the storm surge, the seasonal and the interannual water level variability, because they're all about the same order of magnitude, they really impact our coast. And those last two, the seasonal and the interannual variability are actually quite unique globally um, and sort of quite interesting processes. And finally, um, as we would all be aware, the sea level globally is rising in NWA that tends to be about uh, three and a half millimeters a year. So all of these other processes are sort of superimposed on that longer term trend of sea level rise. So, those northwest winds that we get, not only do they bring larger waves that impact the coast, they also bring quite strong storm surge. Um, and the northwest winds cause the most storm surge because of the Coriolis force, which is the force that results as a result of the Earth spinning. So the same reason that a cyclone rotates uh, clockwise. Um, so when we have winds from the north or the northwest, they uh, actually result in water being transported to the left of that wind. And if you go to the left of that Northwest wind, you run into the coast. Um, and they also sort of pile the water up against the coast down, particularly in Geograph Bay. Um, so on the right there, you can see a screen a grab that I got yesterday from the Port Geograph tide gauge at high tide um, around lunchtime. Uh, so you can see, uh, if you can see my mouse there, um, you can see uh, the predicted tide was meant to be about a meter 
um, and that's the black line on the graph. And then the blue line is actually what the observed uh, tide was. And the difference was between those two is what we call the residual. And in this case, that was the storm surge, which was about uh, 50 centimeters. So we had a 50 centimeter increase in the water level yesterday compared to what we would expect from the tide, um, which is a big difference when the tide range is only about 50 centimeters. So we're effectively doubling the high tide. So the seasonal variations are mainly due to changes in the strength of the Lewin current. And the Lewin current is this as a unique in that we normally have warm water currents uh, on the east coast of continents, but the Lewin currents are unique in that it comes flows uh, its warm water current on the west coast of the continent. Um, and for the same reason that the Coriolis force causes storm surges to be the strongest during northwest winds, uh, because the Lewin current is coming from north to south. When the Lewin current is the strongest, which happens in the autumn and the winter, um, as more water is coming down the coast, it gets pushed to the left. And when it gets pushed to the left, it runs into the coast and that causes an increase in sea level. And the reason that it's the current stronger in the winter is mainly due to reduction in those southerly winds that we have uh, during much of the rest of the year. So here's a 90-day uh, a running average of the water level from the Port Geograph Tidal um, Tide Station. Um, and what you can see is a very distinct seasonal signal, uh, not unlike we saw in the waves, but we have the highest water levels in the winter, and they're about 20 centimeters higher than the water levels in the summer. So this is effectively increasing the mean sea level at a location by 20 centimeters for uh, couple months, um, which is actually quite, quite unique globally, and quite interesting. Um, and then we have the lowest sea levels in the summer, um, in, the winter, in, the, the, in the spring and the summer, and that's because we have really strong southerly winds that sort of hold that warm water up um, to the northwest. And if you would have looked closely, you also see quite big fluctuations year to year um, in that water level, and those are due to La Nina and El Nino events. Um, because those events affect how strong the Lewin current is. So uh, during La Nina events, we tend to have a very strong Lewin current, um, and that strength, strengthening of the current causes higher sea levels, and so that can change sea levels by another 10 centimeters or so. And um, that's really quite a unique thing as well. Um, but this really impacts our coast because if you increase the sea level by 30 centimeters from year from different seasons, for example, you really affect where the shoreline is and how far up the beach the waves are able to go. And this effect from La Nina and, El, uh, and El, El Nino and La Nina is not just at the coast. This is really regional over um, much of the Eastern Indian Ocean. And this is just a, a plot from satellite and altimetry showing basically that this increase in the red or the decrease in sea level uh, during El Nino versus La Nina is really uh, over the entire um, uh, Eastern Indian Ocean, but concentrated at the coast. So now getting more into the research, now we have an overview of the, the sort of processes and the sort of moderate, um, modern day processes. Can we, can we use that knowledge to really try and develop a system that will predict what the beaches are gonna do from uh, these storms? Uh, not unlike you would, um, predict how strong the wind's going to be from, uh, from a storm like the Bureau of Meteorology does. To get at this, we have an Australian Research Council linkage project with um, partners, University of New South Wales, the Bureau of Meteorology, um, and locally the City of Mandurah and the Department of Transport. And that's to really test whether or not we can come up with a system that will develop a, um, an early warning system for coast floor erosion and inundation. And that includes two components, which I'll sort of run through quite quickly. And the first is basically a regional scale, uh, medium resolution, first pass. And that's sort of based on knowing which way the waves are gonna come, how big they're gonna be. Can we predict the areas that are gonna have the biggest the waves and therefore likely the most erosion? And the second is really at a few sites, can we apply very detailed models to try and predict um, essentially how much of the beach is going to change, how much sand is going to move, where the shoreline's going to be. And the storm that we had on the 25th of May really provided us with our first 
data set for this um, for this project. Um, and it was quite an impressive storm. Uh, I think you know, the sort of consensus is it's about a one in a 10 year event. Um, and it was quite unique in its broad um, spatial extent. So the left figure there shows uh, essentially output from a Bureau of Meteorology model, basically where you have large waves and indicated by the dark green, extending more or less all the way from Albany up to Exmouth. And that's quite uncommon. And on the right there is a sort of similar model that we've set up specifically for this project uh, to predict the waves. And this is during the height of the storm. Um, and this essentially showed us that waves offshore uh, were upwards of about 10 meters. And this also then is, is feeds into that regional first pass because from this, we can look at the areas along the coast that have the largest waves. Um, and the biggest waves from this storm came more from the west, actually. And so you can see that the areas to the north of Rottnest Island there, um, north of the, the Swan River, actually were getting a fair amount of wave energy more than they would if the waves were more from the southwest, whereas the areas to the south were still reasonably protected. And then once you get south of Point Pear and everything was pretty well exposed until you get down um, into Geograph Bay. Um, and we were really quite lucky with this particular event because we, we were able to get a couple of other data sets that we normally wouldn't get from a storm like this. Uh, and the first of that is that uh, we operate a couple of uh, drifting or a couple of wave buoys, two of which are drifting. Um, and those drifting wave buoys happen to be sort of in the perfect spot to record uh, the waves from this particular storm event. Uh, so the first is sitting about 500 kilometers to the southwest of Cape Lewin. Uh, the second is sitting about 500 kilometers northwest of Geraldton. Um, and they were floating more or less in those same uh, locations when that storm came by and gave us a pretty impressive uh, direct measurements of how big the waves were during that storm. And so this is sort of the time series from those two locations. So the red uh, is that wave buoy to the northwest of Geraldton. The black is the one to the southwest of Cape Lewin. And the one to Cape, off Cape Lewin um, exceeded nine, nine meters on the sort of 25th of May there. Um, and the one to the northwest of Geraldton got up to about eight meters. Now, waves that large aren't that uncommon in this part of the ocean, but what was quite impressive about this event um, is particularly for that, that location to the northwest of Geraldton is how big the waves were, but how long they, um, how long they persisted for. So the waves were more or less in excess of seven meters for more than 24 hours, which is actually quite uncommon. And then you can see for that location to the southwest of Cape Lewin in the black line, the waves were sort of between six and seven meters um, for another several days. So essentially over almost over six meters for about a week at a time. Um, and the second unique data set that we have for this event is that uh, with our partners, the Parent Naturalist Partnership, which is the consortium of local councils from Rockingham down to Bustleton, uh, we for them fly the coast, that section about 200 kilometers of close twice a year in a helicopter and take uh, photographs essentially out of the helicopter to document the changes in the coast. And we sort of did our normal um, biannual flight in early May as sort of scheduled. But then after this event, we were lucky and that the Paranaturalist Partnership uh, was able to fund another flight for us to do that. And I'll sort of highlight some of the pre and post storm imagery um, now. And all of that imagery is available on a website that we maintain, as well as the, um, the wave data is available on another web website that I uh, showed a few slides ago. And the URLs are both on the presentation there. So just looking at a few different sites. So this is Bustleton Jetty, um, actually sort of before the storm. And this section of beach actually wasn't looking that great. Um, and that's because we actually had quite a big storm in, in late April and early, early May. Some of you may remember. And all of that brown stuff on the beach is actual, um, is beach rack. So that seagrass that's sort of been ripped out of the water and washed up on the beach. So this is the sort of pre-storm. And then a few weeks later, we can see the beach to the, um, to the left of the jetty got pretty well eroded, as well as um, to the right, on the far right, you can see that water is right up against the, that riprap, that, um, those rocks. Um, and we also have uh, a lot more rack on the beach. Moving further down the coast, uh, 
And what was particularly interesting about this event is that water levels were quite high because of that storm surge. And the dunes down in, once you get into Geograph Bay are quite low, about two meters. And so what we saw is quite a lot of evidence of, of overwash and inundation. So if you look particularly at the house with the swimming pool there, um, and the ones the next to the right of it, you can see that they have nice grass in their backyards. And now if we go um, to the photo after the, after the event, you can see quite a lot of sand has been pushed into the backyards of those houses. And that shows a significant um, evidence of overwash from that event. Just not too far down the street, sort of similar thing. We have some houses here that actually show some evidence of inundation prior to the storm. But then if we, we zoom through, you can actually see quite a lot more evidence of inundation. And if you look at that vacant block there in the middle, you can actually see what looks like a, a, a fan as the sand ran over that dune and then sort of washed out and spread out as it got um, into that, that calm open area. And as sea levels increase, then these events like this are gonna become increasingly common. Um, and you can see in these last two photos, the water essentially was right almost at the back of some of these houses. And this was only a, a sort of anomaly, a one in 10 year event. Moving up the coast to Mandurah, so the, the section from really from Mandurah down to Bunbury is fronted by much, much higher dunes. And the dunes from that event uh, were really significantly eroded. So just looking at this photo of Mandurah before um, and after, we see all the dune vegetation cut back um, and quite a significant cliff there on the edge. And similarly in Capel, if you just sort of focus on the areas near that stairway in the center of the image, that's the before and after, the dunes are quite cut back. And then actually, if you look at a photo of that stairway um, from after the event, you can see basically well, the, the, the footings for three of the posts holding that stairway uh, are either exposed or sort of totally ripped off. And you can see all that fresh vegetation on the beach indicating that that dune has been totally undercut. And the second thing that we did at our, at our very um, focus site in Mandurah, we did pre and post um, uh, storm drone surveys. And for those of you that would have seen Nick Callow's Science Exchange talk a few weeks ago, he provided a great overview of how you can use drones to calculate or to produce very detailed um, digital elevation models. Um, and in the coastal space, since about 2015, drones have really taken off um, and replaced much more time consuming methods of surveying in the beach. So we were able to get out just before the storm, storm and then after it again. Um, and essentially um, what happens is you, the drone flies up in the air, takes all of these images, and you're able to stitch those images together using a technique called structure from motion. Um, to produce a very detailed digital elevation model of the beach. Um, so this is the site in Mandurah, just to the south of Dawesville Channel. Uh, so we're able to stitch those images together and this allows us to survey uh, almost two kilometers of beach in about 40 minutes, which would have taken uh, hours and hours and hours with sort of the older techniques we used to use. Um, and from an event like this, we can do our, our pre-storm survey, our post-storm survey, and then take the difference of these elevation models, and that will give us the elevation change. And from this event, we essentially saw a uh, pretty significant erosion of the dunes, upwards of a meter and a half in some locations, indicated by the red there, uh, in broad areas of excess of a meter of elevation change. And the dune erosion I'd like to end on really, this is the last, um, the last slide, but basically, you know, a lot, a lot of people, it can be quite distressing to see the dunes get eroded like this. Um, but I'd like to think about the dunes as really being the beach's savings account. So when the times get tough, the, the beach can draw down the sand that's stored in those dunes um, to buffer against the storms and protect, um, protect more. And that's part of the natural system. And you know, the dunes will hopefully come back. But when you get into the big problems is when you have development on those dunes or the dunes are, are otherwise sort of eroded. But you know, the dunes eroding like this are really providing their sort of natural um, buffering capacity. And so long as they're able to, to perform this natural, they, they, this natural cycle, they really provide a natural uh, buffer for the beach. 
So that's all I have. Hopefully that was um, uh, enjoyable and, and provided some good information about what happens along our coast. That was great, Jeff. Thanks so much for that interesting talk. Um, got quite a few questions coming in. So if people can just add their questions to the Q&A at the bottom, um, then we can and we can pick those up as we go. So the first question we've got from uh, is from Leslie and Leslie says, some council trucks, uh, some councils truck sand into popular beaches after erosion. Is there any value in that? Uh, yes, I, there is. So um, that's what we would call sand nourishment. And so sand nourishment can be a good way to alleviate temporary erosion. Um, and that's become quite a popular way to avoid having to build seawalls and other hard engineering structures. Um, the disadvantage of it is, is that it's sort of a continual process. It's not something that you can usually do once and then forget about it. You have to kind of commit to continue to do that. But it is much more of a, a softer, sort of more natural means of coastal protection. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question from Emma. Emma says, why is there such a large amount of rack and debris on Cottesloe Beach? Is it a result of the storms or are there other ocean conditions that are influencing the debris? No, it's, it's purely a result of the storms. I mean, there's been a couple pretty big storms this year already. Um, and at the end of the summer, all of that seagrass and other aquatic vegetation is all, is all grown up. Uh, and as those big waves come along, they have provide make strong currents and those strong currents to rip all of that stuff off the seafloor. Um, so it is, it is quite a natural process. The problem right. is when Look, you have structures that catch all of that, like jetties and, and the like. Okay, loads of questions coming in now. So from Karen, Karen asks, is there any evidence that the storm events on coastal erosion are getting more severe with time? uh well the general consensus is um that the storm intensity may increase and this is speaking more globally rather than locally um but the frequency may um uh decrease so locally generally speaking in a warmer world you would expect the storms to be pushed further to the poles um and so generally the expectation is that it, that WA will get less storms because more storms will be passing south of Australia. But the storms that do hit, because they're over warmer water, may be more energetic. But that's still a very active area of research and debate within the community. Great. Uh, Eva's got a question that I'm desperate to know as well. Where do you source the sand that you put back on the beach? Do you get that from another beach? And then is it like just a continuously <laughs> never ending process? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And it's a question that people have uh, thought about for eternity. So it sort of depends where you are. Um, a lot of places, it's very common to actually dredge sediment from offshore areas and put that on the beach. That's not done uh, in WA that I'm really aware of. Um, usually it's from quarries or other inland sources, to most of my knowledge. But in some places, yes, they do take it from one beach and take it and put it on the other. Um, and actually in, in Mandra and a lot of places where there's natural um, or, or artificial structures that block the movement of sand, they often will pump it. So they make a slurry and they pump it from one location to the other to get it around the jetties or various structures. Um, loads of really nice comments just saying what a great presentation it was as well, Jeff. Um, question here from an anonymous attendee. What is unique about the west coast of Western Australia to allow the presence of a warm current rather than a cold one as usually happens? Uh, it just has to do with the, the sort of geography of the Indian Ocean, basically. Um, so you get quite a lot of warm water trapped up um, in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, and that water, as it sort of spills out of that area into the ocean, um, it wants to flow to the south. Um, and normally when you would have it, you normally just don't have that, that warm water up there, but because it's flowing to the south and the Coriolis force forces it to the left, it runs into the, um, it runs into the continent of Australia. So it really has to do with sort of just the geography of the Indian Ocean Basin. Cool. 
And Gunn's got a question. Is there a way of knowing if the sand washed out will return in part at least? Uh, that's more difficult to predict, um, but Perth or in the southwest coast of WA is actually quite um, lucky in that there's a really a massive offshore reservoir of sand. And so while there's been isolated areas, pockets of long-term erosion, most of the coastline around Perth particularly has actually been fairly stable. And that's largely because there's an offshore reservoir of sand and that sand kind of continually migrates on shore. Okay, great. Um, so Simon's got a question saying, the shape of the coast shows geomorphology that suggests both south to north sand transport and then big storms that also head north to south. So in your opinion, which is the geologically significant vector likely to lead to long-term preservation over thousands of years? Oh, Simon, uh, we can talk about that potentially later, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're about three orders of magnitude beyond my attention span with a thousand. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so Robin's got a question here saying, <clears throat> Uh, rock groins constructed 30 to 40 years ago at Sorrento Beach have contributed to unnatural sands movement. Um, should and can these be removed, do you think? Well, I mean, they certainly could be removed. Um, the, the should is, is a more difficult question. So, um, I mean, the, the, the groins there are actually just sort of part um, I mean, the whole Hillary's Harbor is a, a natural structure that's, that's blocking sand transport. So the groins there are kind of more of the, the sort of band-aid to protect of the much larger injury, which is the, um, the harbor. So I, I think you have to, would have to consider that whole system um, rather holistically rather than think about the individual groins. And in a related question here from Meg, um, she says that to protect coastal assets close to dunes being eroded, is it recommended to use some engineering treatment, e.g. rock walls at the base of the dune, as well as planting on the dune as well? Well, I mean, certainly if your objective is to not allow the shoreline to erode past a certain point, then rocks or seawalls or whatever are kind of your only option. Um, but I mean, I, I think that, you know, the dunes are there naturally, like I said, and they, they feed and the beach, you know, interact with each other. So um, I think, you know, dunes naturally erode and then hopefully they come back. But if you make a decision that you don't want to allow the coast to erode any further, then the, the solution sort of is, has to be those hard structures like that. Right. And then final question from Aggie, which is saying that there are citizen science means of collecting data, for example, through Fluka posts or the Photomon app. Would you be interested in data gathering through these means and which areas of our coastline are the most dynamic and least studied where this would add value to your research? So that's a great question. And actually, um, next, well, in the next few weeks, we're going to be launching a, a program called Coast Snap. Um, and so that was this initially started by colleagues at Uni of New South Wales, but essentially at nine sites um, in the coast of, uh, from Rockingham down to Bustleton, including on the Bustleton jetty, we're installing these uh, photo brackets. And the idea is that you put your cell phone in the photo bracket so we can then you take a photo and then you upload it to one of our sites. And similar to as what we do with the drones, we're able to by knowing the known position of a few sites, uh, locations within that photo, actually get quantitative information on the um, shoreline position out of those photos. So yes, these are very valuable uh, and stay tuned in about two weeks, these are all gonna be active at nine sites from uh, Rockingham down to Bustleton. And hopefully we're gonna expand that. We'd like to do it at some sites on the South Coast um, because the coastal processes on the South Coast are really been much less studied and uh, an area that I would really like to expand into. So 
I'd just like to thank Jeff very much again for such a fascinating talk. So many questions, Jeff, and you didn't see it, but a really, really active chat going on as well with people coming up with some great suggestions for how to um, manoeuvre sand effectively between the different beaches. Also to the attendees for such a um, really, really rigorous series of questions and a great chat all the way through. And everyone stay safe and look forward to seeing you at the next Exchange series. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you.